in the middle of the journey of our life, I came to myself within a dark wood where the straight way was lost. For many of us, the straight way has been lost. Not because we lack faith, but because science has taught us to doubt what we cannot prove. The way to understand nature is through its science based upon experiment, not through some sort of revealed truth of any scripture. Science says we need empirical data before we can accept something to be true. Does the primacy of proof really reflect the world we live in, the people we are? I think it is central to the human condition of many humans that they believe in a God. Okay, there are some characters and some quite noisy characters who refuse to believe in a God. But I think for many people, many races, many eons, they have felt the need to acknowledge something bigger and beyond themselves. hard to know what to believe these days. The old certainties of religion seem out of place in a material world, but the new certainties of science don't always fill the gap. We don't believe the scientists, we totally and patently don't believe the politicians. Our parents don't seem to know what's going on. So there's two ways to go. You either go hunting yourself for, for something that resembles the truth to you, to give meaning to your life. Every human being needs meaning to their life. If you don't have meaning to your life, you go and you sell crack or you, you do something wild, because why not? Time was when religion offered that meaning. The Vatican City is a monument the capacity of past generations to believe in God without proof, but often without question either. Faith, there is no proof for, for faith. There is no proof for God's existence. I mean, the end and the purpose of God is not to find out that he exists, because while it's, it's a basic premise that God exists, I mean, when we face God after this, after this life, He's not going to say, did you believe that I exist? Even in his own time, the people of Christ's time said to him, give us a sign, give us some proof so that we can believe in you. By what authority do you say and do what you do? And Christ said, this is an evil generation that asks for a sign. No sign will be given it but the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days. So in other words, the sign with a capital T-H-E, capital S-I-G-N, is Christ's resurrection. That is the sign. Our strong tendency to believe in God is part of our drive to tell stories, to make sense of what would otherwise be gaps in our experience. Andy Clark is a cognitive scientist trying to understand the nature of intelligence. He has a different certainty, that God is simply a byproduct of activity in the human brain. Think of us as resource-limited creatures. So we don't have infinite amounts of brain power, and we don't have infinite amounts of time. We have to make our decisions on the hoof, and we have to make decisions on the basis of very limited information and limited processing time. 
Add to that the fact that we're social creatures, that we spend a lot of our time trying to deal with problems that we encounter in social situations. What that yields, I think, is a kind of intelligence that, that when it comes up against a, a spot where it can't make sense of how this gave way to this, it tends to interpose between the two things a kind of will. Somebody wanted that to happen, that's why it happened. And when we have events that we can't make sense of, I think we interpose a kind of unseen willer. So to begin with, maybe you saw, you know, sunrise is often followed by sunset. We don't know why. Oh, but I know, I have this explanatory schema in the back of my mind when two things are systematically linked, but I can't see why. So I think that God is just part of a good story for making sense of a lot of things that otherwise wouldn't seem to make sense to us. we can defer the choice of what to believe. But as we grow older, the questions often resurface, still unanswered, but now more pressing. <laughs> There's nothing more horrific than knowing that we are going to die. If I'm going to die and that I'm going to cease to be, then I, I kind of personally fall into a total black hole. Then what is anything for? Where does anything have meaning? Where does anything fit? The moment of death is the, the par excellence shocker in which you are confronted with uh, the end of your existence, the meaning of your existence, uh, the meaning of your life, of your person, uh, it kind of really f pushes us up against the wall and says, you know, okay, now from here on, where are you going to go? For science, death is so certainly the end that anything which argues against it can be nothing more than a comforting story. But there are people whose faith in something beyond death is based not on religious teachings, but on what they feel is a direct and undeniable experience of God. When they opened me up, I'd actually had a massive hemorrhage. Um, I was actually pregnant. I had a pregnancy in the fallopian tube and the tube had ruptured, and I was hemorrhaging internally from this uh, incident. I found myself standing beside the bed, but it wasn't me standing beside the bed, it was a shadow of me, I suppose you'd say, I don't know. Um, and you then realise, oh, that's a drip stand, and oh, yes, there's a tube and there's some blood in it, and you realise it's attached to you, and you realise that it's you in the bed. So I was a bit confused and I could hear somebody saying, you know, don't be too concerned, um, just come with me. But I didn't see anybody. Uh, and there was this really, really the most amazing bright light. You are brought to meet this, the most amazing being. Oh boy. Power, love, compassion, absolutely profound being. And suddenly you think, well, if this is heaven and I'm in front of who I think I am, I'm not really worthy to be here. Just this most overwhelming feeling of compassion and love. Is that I think that is the thing that stays with you, with you the strongest. Conventional science says experiences like Heather's are a sort of illusion, which must occur either when the person is losing consciousness or regaining it, but definitely not when clinically dead. Peter Fennick is a neuropsychiatrist who has been studying near-death experiences 
for over 20 years. He thinks there are problems with this conventional explanation. Well, we know a lot of what happens when the heart stops. And what happens is that the brain rhythms are normal for about six seconds, and then they rapidly decay, and you get a flat EG. Now, flat EG means that all those cortical structures which create our world for us are not working. So if it doesn't occur as you're going down, and if it doesn't occur while you're in the depth of the experience, because it can't in our science, uh, then it has to occur as you're recovering. Now, if you deprive the brain of oxygen and you recover from it, then your thinking is all over the place. But the thing about the near-death experience is it's highly lucid and it's very clear. So it can't be in the confusion or arousal, but so when did it occur? But no matter that we still do not understand when or why they occur, no matter how sincere people are when they say something real happened to them, mainstream science still insists the experience of God has no external reality. There's a lot of psychological research about this just showing how we make things up, but we don't know we're making them up. We find ourselves doing something, and we tell a story to make sense of it, and we honestly believe our own story. And the thought is that there's a bit of your brain, and its job is to make sense of things. A bit like in a big firm or a government, you have a public relations department whose job is to make sense of what the firm does. Unfortunately, no one in the firm tells them anything, really, so they have very limited information to go on, um, but they have to tell a good story. We are pattern recognition creatures. We're always looking for patterns and finding them even when they're not there. This is a case where by its very construction we have four ink blots on the page as the thing in itself, and yet our minds impose on that something that simply is not there, which is a square with these illusory boundaries and contours. And I suspect, as we're finding increasingly in the way brains process signals, this occurs throughout our reasoning systems, the desire to put in black and white boundaries without sufficient information to do so. God himself may simply be a kind of illusion an artifact of our neural wiring, as is a Knitza square. We have a sense of shadow, a sense of seeing footprints without any real concrete evidence. I could never have dreamed up that experience. Yes, your mind could create something, yeah, but I'm just one of thousands and thousands of people in the world in this present time and through time that's had this experience and relates it. How did I come up with the same story when I'd never read it before or heard anything of it before? How does one quantify that? Peter Fennick knows there is no objective proof for what Heather has been through. But he believes it would be unscientific to ignore the fact that thousands of unconnected people from different cultures have had the same experience. You come back to the fact that these experiences are part of the range of phenomena that you can experience. You have to look at these experiences then and see what value you're going to put on them. <laughs>